Uh, this morning I have asked Christy to come and share a song that I think is going to be appropriate for today's message. So at this point I'm just going to let her come and minister through music.
Being pastor, I get to see a lot of things in your lives that a lot of you guys don't get to see. I get to see things in other people's lives that you may never get an opportunity to see. I get to see some of the worst of people. I get to see some of the best of people. Um, but I, I, I was pondering this week, and I'm going to ask you this question because this, this question came up to me been about a week, 10 days that I've been pondering this. How big is your God? How big is He? And then, what in your life proves or denies that? Because I started looking through scripture, and I've grown up with this idea um, that God is resting. He was the almighty, angry God of the Old Testament. And then the loving everybody, Dr. Spock of the New Testament. And then he just kind of stepped back until the end of time where he comes back. And I remember when I was a, a very young, I used to love reading the Old Testament stories where God would show up with power and authority. And I loved seeing how God interacted with not just people, but with, with armies, with nation states. And, and then, as I got older, into my faith, I started loving the New Testament stories where God became flesh and He interacted on a personal level. Where He saw a person's specific need and He touched them. He touched the leper. You, you, we don't understand how vital that was because the fact that he would touch someone that was unclean by default made him unclean. The fact that he would touch him exposed him to whatever skin disease that they had. These people were shunned by society. They were only allowed to live outside of the town, usually over in areas by, by refuse heaps. <coughs> they lived in the dump. They did not get interaction with normal people. And yet Jesus reached out and touched the leper. He healed the sick. He delivered those that were in bondage. He raised the dead. All of these things according to His Father's will, according to His Father's plan, because He said, I can do nothing except what the Father shows me. That's it. That's all I can do. But I always had this idea that that was then and this is now. And, you know, I, I saw some dynamic things. You hear about things where God still does those, usually somewhere else, where God does miraculous things somewhere else. And, and I wonder, what is different between somewhere else and here. What is so different? Why do we see God sending storms upon a village that has rejected Him and has shunned His people and yet in the midst of that storm that decimates every villager's crop, one field was left untouched. And that was the crop of the family that brought the message of the gospel to that village. And why did that one field reap such a harvest that it was able to feed not just that family, but the entire village? 
to proclaim His excellencies. To proclaim who He is. See, the, the thing that I look at in Scripture that I'm, I'm coming to realize is I've always looked at Scripture as, as a bunch of extraordinary people doing extraordinary things because of an extraordinary God. And I realize that's not true at all. It's really a bunch of ordinary people. Just like you and I. Some of them better, some of them worse. I think of Peter who denied Jesus after being with him in ministry for three years. He denies him. I never knew him. I don't know what you're talking about. He calls down curses on his head. God curse me if I ever knew this man. This Peter that was one of the pillars of the church. I look at Paul who in his zeal for religious religiosity persecuted the church and was even participant in the deaths of some of the early church members. Well, I'm not that bad. I've never participated in the, the execution of someone. But these were men who had faith in an extraordinary God. How big is your God? Because I want to share some things about how big the God of this Bible is. Now, we could read whole chapters, we could read entire books that do nothing but show how big this God is. But is this God the same one that we are serving? Or have we in some way minimized Him? Have we shrunk Him? Have we limited Him? Have we reduced Him to something other than what He is? Have we tried to make Him more manageable? Psalm chapter 33, verses 6 and 7. Go ahead and turn there real quick. I'm going to hit a number of scriptures this morning. I've just picked out a few. <coughs> Starting in verse 6, Psalm 33. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And by the breath of his mouth, all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap and puts the deep in storehouses. Now, think about this for a moment. The God of the Bible spoke into existence. He said it, and it was. He simply spoke it. As a matter of fact, in the New Testament, it tells us it's by His Word that all things hold together. It's an active part on Him to keep everything going. He says, let it be, and it is. And He says, let it continue to be, and it continues to be. But this God spoke and all the heavenly hosts came to be. He spoke and there was light and it was separate from the dark. He spoke and the earth came into existence because He wanted it. And then He fashioned it not with a, an artist's hands, but with the word of his mouth. And he created the incredible things that we see around us. He created the beauty in nature 
the animals of the sea, of the sky, of the land. And then at the end of all things, he created us. Now it's interesting because he actually formed us. He took his hand and made man. And then when man was made and he saw that man would need a helper, he took that hand again and he made woman. It's the only thing in all creation that we know that God set his hand to. Everything else he says, God said. But this one he fashioned and then breathed life into. This is the God of the Bible. This is the God that we are saying we serve. Flip over a couple Psalms. Psalm 147. And I know for every one of these that I give you, there are dozens that could be used in their place. Psalm 147. I'm going to start in verse 1. Praise the Lord. It's an exclamation. Praise Him. All throughout Scripture, people are and were directed to praise Him. Why? Because He's worthy. <laughs> then He goes on and He says, For it is good to sing praises to our God. For it is pleasant, and a song of praise is fitting. It fits. It's appropriate. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. Now think about this for just a moment, because I just read a passage to you that God is doing today. Jeannie, help me with the word. The return of Israel back to the land. Uh, well, Aliyah. 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 Mm -hmm. Aliyah. See, this was given thousands of years ago. This was given at a time when, when Israel was still in the land that God had promised them. And then they were exiled. And they came back. And then after a time they were exiled again because of the hardness of their heart. And yet this word says, the Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. 1947, <coughs> the land that had been promised to Israel was returned to them. Or rather, it would be more fitting to say, they were returned to it. And the land that God promised would be flowing with milk and honey thrives again. We are seeing people from all over the globe. Jews being called home. God is gathering them. And He's bringing them back to the place that He promised them. The Almighty God is moving right now. But let's read further. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Now think about that for a moment. I have five children. I have difficulty remembering five names, especially in the heat of the moment. And you run through the list of names and you can't find the one you want, so you make them up. I determined very early on, hey you at a loud volume would get all of their attention. But think about this for a moment. We can see, we can observe, okay? We can observe 10 billion <coughs> galaxies. That's all we can see. That's as far out as we can go. New ones are being discovered daily. It's right now about 10 billion galaxies. 
So if we estimate and say that each galaxy is home to approximately 100 billion stars. And that's, that's a fairly accurate guess because we, we try to count them. And by we, I mean people that do that, not me. <laughs> I look up at the sky. That is not something that I've ever been called to, to count the stars. I just look up at the sky and marvel. If we take 100 billion stars and multiply it by 10 billion galaxies, let me see if I can get this, this number right here. We come up with 1 billion trillion stars. That's a one with 21 zeros after it. And God calls them each by name. <coughs> I can't even fathom having that many names. A hundred billion trillion. How, how, you know, George Foreman circumvented the need for this. He named all of his children George. <laughs> I guess that works. But, but we know God calls them by different names. He tells us in the book of Job. When you have opportunity this week, I would challenge you, read the last three chapters of the book of Job. The last three chapters, because all of the, the chapters before that, the 37 chapters preceding that, Job is laying down his request, his, his desire for an audience with God. In chapter 38, God answers. Okay? I would use that as a caution. Don't be so quick to want to have a conversation with God to defend yourself. Okay? So, <clears throat> he determines the number of the stars... He gives to all of them <coughs> their names. Great is our Lord. I, I would think so, yeah. Because every one of those stars He breathed into existence. He knows exactly where they are. He knows exactly what they are. He has established their courses. <coughs> which in and of itself, I, I am no scientist. Science I was, I was very weak in. Because most of the time, I had my science book propped up and a book I wanted to read underneath it. Do not follow your pastor's past. Anybody still in school? But I understand that it is a very delicate balance the way God has placed things. Our galaxy in relation to other galaxies. Our solar system in relation to our galaxy. Our planet in relation to our solar system. That if things were off even just a little bit, we would not, we could not be here. That's how finely tuned our God has set things running. He spoke it into being and said it was so. Do you ever wonder what God's name for our son is? I do. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 12. actually read the entire book or the entire chapter I'm going to start back in verse 9 okay it says go on up to a high mountain O Zion herald of good news lift up your voice with strength O Jerusalem, herald of good news, lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. 
Okay, so everything that follows is what they are beholding. Behold, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. What an incredible picture of the love of God. This is a God who is mighty, powerful. It says that his arm rules for him. And yet he carries the sheep. He carries them close to his heart. Up against his chest. But then look at verse 12. This is de describing God. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand. Now think about that for just a moment. Lake Como. Flathead Lake. Gulf of Mexico. The Atlantic, the Pacific, the Indian, the Antarctic. He gathers those waters up in the hollow of his hand. And marked off the heavens with a span, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in balance. Who has done this? Who has measured the Spirit of the Lord or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult and who did he, who made him understand? God looked out and he said the heaven is going to be about that big. A span, the length of your hand. It says, he marked up the heavens with a span, a span. God looked down and said, I'm going to make the heavens about that big. This, this heaven with a billion, trillion stars that we can estimate. With stars that are so big, they would not fit in our solar system. And he said, they're about that big. That, that's how big I'm going to make it. <clears throat> he weighs the mountains. Now, can you imagine what a mountain would actually weigh to a God whose hand measures the universe? Oh, that's an Everest. you got to put on some weight, baby. <laughs> a little light. We see in the, the Old Testament, the original testament, let's call it the original testament. And we see all that God had done. We see in the New Testament, the Second Testament, we see that God was still active, He was doing. And we see at the end, we see in the book of Revelation, all that He has planned yet to come. You want to see how big God is? Look at what happens when the nations gather against him. All the nations will gather together. He will smite them with the sword of his mouth. Remember, remember that, that, that voice that caused creation? It's capable of causing destruction as well. And they will be slaughtered. God took how many days to create the earth? Six. 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 Six days. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. I love what Keith Green, Keith Green said in his song. Uh, Jesus has been working on heaven for ten th or 2,000 years. Can you imagine what an incredible place it's going to be if in six days he made all of this and yet in 2,000 years he's not yet done making what he's got for us? Preparing it. How big is your God? How big is your God? See, the problem is, in order for us to live our lives with, with equanimity, we have to do something with this, this awesome, all-powerful El Shaddai to make it livable. And so what we start to do is we start to minimize 
We start to excuse, we start to write off. People have asked me why um, I am not a part of the um, IFCA, Independent Fundamentalist Church of America. That's the, 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 the non-denomination that Kelly belonged to. And I, I have two reasons why I have not joined with their, their group. They have a, a core set of tenets. There are 17 principles that you have to agree to. And I could not agree to two of them. I, I could not agree to the fact that there are no sign miracles today. I reject that immediately, vociferously. I, I reject that. We may not see them here, and I think that's our fault, not his. I think they may be happening here, and we just don't see it. We don't accept it for what it is. But I know God is moving all over the globe. He is showing himself through signs and wonders to people. You look at some of the stories coming out of the Muslim world where God reveals himself to a Muslim man who has no idea who Jesus is, and yet Jesus appears to him and says, go and find out who Jesus is and what the gospel is. That's a sign. That's a sign. And I can't accept the idea that there are no sign miracles today. The other is they had a condition on your view of eschatology that uh, while I agree in principle, I don't agree that it has to be just this way. And, and so because of those two principles, I cannot in good conscience join with IFCA because their statement declares that you have to agree with all 17 principles. The other 15 I have no problem with. But those two, I, I, I can't in good conscience agree with them. How big is your God? Is your God big enough to create the universe? Because if He's not, He's not the God of the Bible. Is He big enough to speak everything into existence? Because if He's not, He's not the God of the Bible. Is He big enough to handle your problems. Because if he's not, he's not the God of the Bible. Amen. And I want to share with you, because I've struggled with this my entire Christian life, I know he can, I'm just not sure he will. And yet, when I look throughout this book, time and time and time again, he wills. He says, yes, I will. <clears throat> now, Scripture tells us there, you know, God is not a genie. <clears throat> also, often we treat Him as a genie. Rub, rub, rub. Oh, genie of the Bible. This week, I'd like tickets to that concert. That monster truck rally. I'd like victory and whatever it is that I'm setting my focus on this week. If you have it, a couple extra bucks would be nice. <laughs> Ding! Back in the book you go, Genie. Not Genie, Genie. <laughs> Gee, Genie. <laughs> and he goes back until we need him again. Because what can you do with an almighty God whose very word can both create and destroy you? What do you do with an almighty God who has said, I am perfect and pure and holy and righteous and you're not? What can you do but come to Him on your knees? As a matter of fact, whenever people encounter God throughout Scripture, their almost across the board reaction was what? Oh, what? Mm -hmm. Do we have that same attitude about God? Are we willing to get on our face before Him? Or do we think that in some measure there's equality here? 
Have we so diminished God that He is just slightly more than human? Daddy Warbucks? Somebody that I can go to when I have a need, but I really don't want to bother otherwise. Or do we accept that He is capable and more than capable of dealing with every single significant and insignificant area of our lives? Do you understand that God desires to know everything about you? He wants to be intimate with you. He wants you to share everything with Him. <coughs> your successes, your failures, your mediocrity. He wants all of it. He desires that you would come to Him and be with Him and share with Him and talk with Him and spend time with Him and let Him talk to you. He longs for fellowship. Think about that. When all of creation was done and He said, it is very good. What did He do then? He came in the cool of the evening. He walked in the garden. This is good. What's going to happen when everything is made right? On that day, when He puts everything right, well, His dwelling will be with man. His dwelling will be with us. That's what He is longing for. That's what He desires. That's what He wants. Now, I'm, I want to show you a video. Uh, those of you that remember Pastor Kelly, he, uh, he was colorblind. He is colorblind. Um, and I never found out until um, he pointed over to the bulletin board that used to sit over there. And what did he call it? I think he called it Salmon. salmon. It was green. And it was green. <laughs> and everybody's looking around trying to find a salmon bulletin board. Looking in front of some says, is he, are you talking about this one? He says, yeah, the salmon one. Well, this is green. There's a new set of glasses. I want to show you the commercial. He posted this on Facebook yesterday, and I want you to watch this commercial. Go ahead, Josh. <coughs> people that have been colorblind their entire life and they're able to put on these glasses and what these glasses do is they filter depending on where your vision is they filter how you're able to perceive and separate greens and reds and and it's incredible to watch these people that have never seen depth of color before all of a sudden they get to see what color and, and I was watching that and I was so taken with the idea <coughs> that as Christians we should be looking through the lens of the Bible and it should color absolutely everything that we see. That as we look at this world, we can look at it through that black and white, through that 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 color blindness, and 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 see what everybody else sees. Or we can put on the the gospel 
and we can look through the eyes of a people who serve a mighty, powerful, loving God. And we can let that color everything that we see, everything that we do. We can let that infiltrate our conversations. We can let that permeate everything that we do. Whether we're sitting at home alone and, and just by ourselves, or whether we're in the midst of a great company of people, we let that permeate and we let it saturate us. And, and I was just taken by this idea that so many people are walking through this life, they don't know. I had a cousin that he was probably 14 years old before we found out he was colorblind. We were playing checkers on a, a magnetic checker set and the colors were pink and green. And I kept getting frustrated with him because he kept reaching across the board and moving my pieces. So, well, you're cheating, quit. So, I'm beating you, leave that alone. And then after a little while, he got really frustrated and he said, well, I can't see what color is mine and what color is yours. And everybody else in the room was like, what are you talking about? Those are green and those are pink. How hard is that to see? He couldn't see. They were the exact same tone to him. And, and then to be able to see, this is us before Christ. This is us before Christ. We can't see things for what they really are. And then we look through the knot hole of the cross and all of a sudden things come to vibrant life. There is purpose in everything. How big is your God? Because the God of the Bible, who knows every star's name out there and knows every single hair on your head, I'm making it easy on him. He wants you to know how big he is. He wants you to know that he can handle your problems. He wants you to come to him and lay them on him. Listen to what his son says. He says, uh, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, for you are of more value than many sparrows. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. Jesus is throwing out an invitation here. He's putting it before you today. Okay. Now he spoke this 2,000 years ago, but I am reading it today and it's every bit as accurate today as it was then. Yeah. And this is the call. He says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, this is the second part of a triune God who is calling out to you, come and let me give you rest. I don't know if you've ever seen a pair of animals working together, but the thing is they have to be trained to work together. Because if only one is trained, they can't get any work done. But when two of them are trained to work together, they don't just double the amount of work that they can do. It, it grows exponentially. You take one horse that can pull a significant amount and you put it with another horse that can pull an equal amount and they don't just pull double. It is an exponential growth how much they can pull. But they have to be working together. They have to be going the same direction. They have to be doing the same thing. And he is calling out to you. If you are heavy laden, if you are burdened, he is calling out, come to me. Come to me. And I will give you rest. I will give you rest. Yep. So how big is your God? Do you perceive Him as the world maker? Do you perceive Him as the nation destroyer? 
do you perceive him as the almighty God who with the word of his mouth can do whatever he wills? Or is he just a inconvenient convenience sometimes? He's handy to have around occasionally. Have you minimized him to the point where he is ineffective, unable to do anything in your life? Have you just put it up and said, well, God, I will allow you this far and no more? Because I tell you what, if you let loose the Almighty God in your life and let him run wild and do what he wills in your life, he will change you in a dynamic and dramatic way. He will make a new creature out of the old. And that creature will be unstoppable. Because what, what do you fear? They, they're going to hurt you to His glory. They're going to kill you even better. Even better. So how big is your God today? I want to challenge you. Dig in the Word. I don't want to be a church of, of, of people that trust me to read the Word for them. I want you to read the Word. I want you to do the research. Get in the Bible. Start taking a look at how big, how awesome our God is. Amen? Amen. Amen.